Having rights is a very interesting concept. And as George F. Will's new book on the conservative sensibility uh, indicates, they are not bestowed on anybody by government. They should be protected by government. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a really interesting manifestation of this. Uh, on the other side of the screen is Chair Rodney Coston. Now I'm gonna use some terminology that may not be familiar to uh, Canadian ears or what are now Canadian ears or ears that are in what is now Canada, because uh, Chair Coston is uh, in Washington state and he is the chair of the Confederation Tribes of the Coville, Sinaiaks being one of those tribes and tribes is what we might call bands or what the Indian Act might require indigenous people to call bands. Well, with all that confusing stuff, uh, Chair Coston, I, I think we either need a dictionary or have you take over the conversation, one of the two. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know where you'd like for me to begin. As I was saying, you know, the creation of the international border severed, you know, the St. Ikes and also the Ukunakim, which are two of our tribes that extend up into British Columbia. Um, but it not only severed, you know, our tribes, but our people and also even our families, you know, many families were, were split, some ending up in Canada and then some here in the United States. You know, but we were forcibly removed from our, our homelands. And, uh, you know, as you say, rights, you know, we've always felt like we are St. Ike's people. And, you know, we always felt we had those rights. As you said, they're not bestowed on us. Those are inherent rights that we're born with. And we never relinquished those rights ourselves. So, you know, this has been going on for some time, ever since, you know, our tribes were um, divided. Uh, you know, many of our families still travel and today still travel back and forth and we attend each other's ceremonies or gatherings, you know, you know, that the border in between us, you know, can be a challenge a lot of times, especially today with COVID. Uh, but our people still travel back and forth frequently. Um, and, and that makes it difficult, you know, like today, you know, and then having that we're either um, considered citizens of the United States or First Nations of Canada. Um, and, but, you know, that border isn't our border. You know, our people traveled freely at one time. Well, fair enough. And if you think about that for, you know, uh, 25 seconds, that becomes uh, obvious that the border long predates uh, your ancestors' existence. Now, we, uh, I got us into a, a little bit of a muddle on terminology because you're uh, the chair and not the chief or the sachem, and that's fair enough. People can call themselves what they want. But then there's that pronunciation issue, uh, uh, Okanakin. Uh, I think many um, people living in Canada, uh, and as I used to live in, in Vancouver and visit the Okanagin, we would mispronounce it Okanagan. So I just put that uh, on the record for clarification. Um, now, take me back to how this became a goal uh, of your organization. You have, you have several uh, uh, Indigenous groups uh, in, within your federation, and you, you decided to reassert or assert or get back your traditional rights in Canada. Tell me how that evolved. Well, like I said, you know, our people and our families were severed. And a lot of our elder people, our ancestors, used to talk about this all of the time, that never forget where our people came from, you know, where our traditional homelands are at. You know, those places that our people fished or where they gathered, where our ancestors are buried. You know, those are very important and sacred places for us. And, uh, you know, Native people were very uh, uh, profoundly attached to the lands where we came from. You know, that's where our culture exists, our language. And, and so to pass that knowledge down, how can you do that if you can't be in those same places as where your ancestors once were? You know, our homelands extended from the northern part of Washington state clear up into British Columbia. And uh, I can remember hearing many of our elders. I remember we have winter dancers, winter dances here. And these are, you know, spiritual dances that happen um, every year. And my aunt used to put them on all the time. And I remember this one time that she and two other elders got up and they were speaking and, and they were talking about our gathering places of where we would gather our traditional foods and that we could never forget that. And then, um, then 
the an elder man got up and he was saying about our fishing places, you know, and what that was like for our, our, our people. He said, um, you would never know, you you can't imagine what that was like for us when we were able to travel, you know, the Columbia and all of its tributaries and, you know, our people would gather together and have all these um, different events, you know, dances and gaming and gambling and all these other things that would take place during the summer at these fishing stations. And he said, he again said, don't ever forget that. And then my aunt was talking about our ceremonies, you know, and how important that was to keep those going in our language and our culture, you know, and their whole message was really, we need to continue and remember our people came from Canada um, which, you know, north of the United States border, and that we always needed to fight for that. Um, another elder, you know, even earlier got up and questioned, you know, um, you know, some of the ministries in British Columbia and said, why is there not a reserve for the St. Ike's people in Canada? You know, that's where our people came from. But, you know, we were many people, many of our people were forcibly removed and it placed them either in Canada or the United States. Well, Chair, I think that I and many um, uh, people who are living in, in uh, what is now Canada would have an inkling of an understanding of what you've just described. Uh, I, most Canadians live within a couple of hundred miles of the American border. Uh, anyone who is more than about 35, 40 years of age remembers going across the border either with no ID or maybe a driver's license, right. or in my youth, a wave at the border guard and rudimentary questions. But we have never been forbidden uh, from going one side or the other, or uh, never have been, you know, most of us have never been expelled. So we have an inkling of that idea. So let me ask you to answer your own question. Why was there no uh, reserve in in uh, what is now British Columbia for your people? Well, I think a lot of the resources that were in, important at the time, you know, and, um, you know, all the, the immigration to, you know, Canada and the United States and, you know, looking at those areas that were very valuable at the time, you know, and it, you know, really displaced a lot of tribes, you know, really by force and no, for no other reason. And I was just going to say, you know, that what led us to this too was that, you know, through the development, you know, um, and many developments happen and occur, but there was going to be a disturbance of a grave site, um, of several graves there in Canada that are in the homelands of our St. Ike's people. And that was what really triggered a lot of this. You know, I mean, it's, just for clarification, pardon the interruption, but I mean, it's a big uh, country and a big continent. For those who don't know British Columbia well, uh, this was the so-called Two Rivers policy of W.A.C. Bennett, the premier uh, mm -hmm. for, I think, 20 odd years, uh, social credit, uh, damming up the rivers, generating power and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, attracting industry. Uh, kind of an old hat way of going about things now. River restoration, as you know better than I, is a big deal. Uh, but that kind of that activity in the 60s postdates the Sinaiics uh, being expelled and being declared extinct. So can you go back to that event for me? Yeah, well, you know, we never did feel we were extinct. We were always here. And, you know, I don't believe, you know, here, even in the United States, you know, I was, that was before, you know, when I was growing up and, you know, I used to just hear my grandmother and my, my dad talk about this and, but it didn't make a lot of sense to me back at, at the time being so young. Um, but yeah, all of the, you know, when all the development that did occur and really looking at importance of the water for flood control, for power production, for agriculture, you know, both the United States and in Canada, you know, so that water became, and those lands um, nearby became very important um, to both governments. And so many decisions were made you know, on extraction of those resources or control of those resources and, you know, the, without any input from the tribes at all. And okay, but, but you have an even bigger problem, and that is, is that you're south of the international border. You are trying to reassert the uh, rights that you have as um, people who historically traversed the border uh, and the border bisected your community. So how did you, how did it evolve that you were going to try to uh, fight this and assert your rights in what is now Canada? 
Well, you know, it, there were so many things that took place, you know, the, the legal political histories in Canada, as well as political histories in the United States were, there were a lot of similarities, but there were a lot of differences. And, you know, especially in the United States during that time, nuclear families or our families were broken apart. Children were taken to boarding schools and that happened in Canada as well, you know, because to enforce the assimilation and acculturation of the people, they wanted us to accept everything non-Indian, the English language, you know, and all of these paternalistic laws and regulations were passed, you know, that everyone thought were in the best interest of us in the tribes, but also certainly in the best interest of, you know, the much larger communities around us and really looking at those resources of where tribes lived and where, you know, they wanted and needed those resources. And so, you know, it was the forced removal of native people off of their traditional homelands and put onto either reserves or reservations, which we call reservations here in the United States. And so, you know, that history um, of then what happened at that point in time when our tribes were separated, there are some differences of the, what had happened in Canada as what had happened in the United States. Um, you know, down here in the United States, every effort was made, you know, to assimilate the people, our native people. Um, you know, children were brought away hundreds of miles to boarding schools and where, you know, or even close by, because we did have some Catholic boarding schools that were here on this reservation as well. Um, and, you know, th that took on a whole history of just itself. Um, they were also relocating Indian people off into cities to assimilate them in the mainstream society. So there were just all these different things that were taking place. And as well as they were trying to terminate tribes here in the United States. And the Cobble tribe or the Confederated Tribes of the Cobble Reservation, we were the last tribe that was attempted to be terminated here in the United States. It was a long battle here that lasted for about 10 years that the, many of our people fought and eventually won. And we are still here today. So we had so many things taking place. And, you know, so looking at just those everyday needs of who are trying to keep our family units together and, you know, there were so many of our rights that were just being taken away from us. Well, you know, as time evolved, you know, and tribes um, took on greater autonomy, you know, of managing our own programs and our own affairs, at least here in the United States. And then, um, you know, developing our, having our own economic development, developing our own governments, it brought us more to a level of where we could start looking at, okay, well, look at all the things that have happened to us in our history, especially to our natural resources and our homelands, and that we wanted to protect those areas that were really sacred and important to us. And like I said, back in the 80s, when they were looking at disturbing many of those graves, you know, for development, um, up at Balakin, that's when many of our people went up there to fight that cause and, you know, and protect those graves, which they did. But then at that point in time, once we were there and our people were there again, and from the urgence of a lot of our elders at the time, they were saying, don't give up on us. This is who you are. This is our country, you know, and you, you, we need access to those lands to, um, be able to to pass down our knowledge of the, those areas in our culture and the ways of our people. Um, it just stirred, I think, uh, a lot in the our people here. And, you know, they took um, um, many more, kept going up into Canada and looking at, you know, well, we've never relinquished our rights there. We didn't do that. They took them away from us or, you know, and so there was a decision here made at our tribal government at that point in time, we have to fight this. And, you know, the, even with the forced, uh, the hunting rights case with Rick Dizitel, um, you know, and he did that, you know, uh, killed the, an elk there, brought it back over the border, and then he gave it to a lot of the elder people on our reservation. Um, you know, but that's one of the traditional foods of our people too, that has helped, that has sustained our people for thousands of years as well as the fish and other things. And we want that for our future generations. Uh, Chair Costin, you're saying so many intriguing things. Um, I'm trying to keep up uh, here and I can go back about three minutes and tell you that most of what you said occurred in uh, what is now America uh, occurred in Canada. Uh, the um, potential extinction, the government declaring who is and who isn't an Indian, 
uh, the creation of band councils, uh, imposing a form of government. And uh, again, I uh, just have George F. Will's book in my mind, and he points out that, you know, not everybody around the world wants American style democracy imposed on them. And uh, a number of wars ha have proven that. Uh, so could you succinctly tell me how the American government went about trying to make a people extinct? Or, or uh, what, what, did, what was the term you used? It wasn't extinction, it was... Uh, termination. Termination, I mean, how, how, yeah. how do you go about doing that? Well, you know, I guess if you can theorize about this in many different ways, you know, all the way back to the early 1900s when, um, you know, the reservations were created. And here they allotted land to individual tribal members at the time for either agriculture or for uh, uh, grazing. And um, um, then the rest of the undisposed lands on the reservation, they opened up for homesteading to non-Indian people. And so a lot of homesteads and, you know, even at the time, the um, superintendent who was the federal officer here on this our reservation had the authority to sell the land, um, the Indian people's land without their consent. And many times did that even below market value. And so lands were even taken away from us. And we feel that that was even really the beginning of termination of tribes. And then also relocating Indians off the reservation, breaking up our family and trying to do everything they could to remove our language and our culture. Um, and then the actual legislation that was posed back in the 1960s, which they said, we will pay you um, so much money per tribal member to terminate your reservation. But once you do that, you will no longer be an Indian or a native person or St. Ike's or Ukunakin. You, you know, you will, even those tribes that were terminated, their birth certificates were changed to white. Yeah, very, 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 very similar to a process uh, that that uh, is still going on in Canada. And by the way, you know, just one scintilla of of a good word about misguided people. There was a uh, white paper in about 1969 in Canada, which talked about assimilation. And I, I think our prime minister at the time, Pierre Trudeau, was looking at the integration efforts of black people and thinking that rights for a group were not a good idea. Rights for everybody was a good idea and assimilation was the idea, but that didn't last very long. There was a, a group of chiefs who, uh, who set that straight, uh, interestingly enough, but that, that may have been what was in the mind of uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, every effort was made here. There was even a lot of propaganda that was put out there by the federal government. They would try to portray native people as being drunk and lazy and, you know, everything in a, the, the traditional way of our life not being good. And then they would show those who became assimilated, you know, and dressed nice and clean cut haircuts and educated. I mean, you know, the, so there was a lot of propaganda at the time as well. Yeah. And, uh, and then, then too, even in the school system and in the religious orders, you know, that colluded, you know, for assimilation and acculturation, um, a lot of that occurred as well. My dad used to speak about, he went to this Catholic boarding school and every time they heard him speak his language, he got beaten, you know, and so did all the rest of the children. And well, it don't take you long as a kid, you know, to learn English and to think that that's not, you know, good anymore. You know, you want to, to adopt that English language and the name they, they gave you because, you know, our people had our own names, but even with those children back at the time, they would give them Christian names or other English names, you know, so that's why you even see some uh, Native children named after presidents or after uh, saints, you know, I mean, there's uh, even just how Native people got their first and last names there, you know, that's quite a story just in itself. But right, now, again, it was just another attempt at the assimilation. Now, again, about six minutes ago, you talked about how your elders and relatives talked about how important it was to remain uh, connected to the land in Canada and the uh, uncovery, uh, uh, uncovering of a burial ground was one of the catalysts. Let me just 
for you know ask a longer version of why stay connected because we have a lot of uh, I have a lot of people I know came from the British Isles, England, Scotland, uh, Ireland, Wales. They were all murdering each other for years, very unpleasant uh, historical uh, events. And then we have all the uh, immigrants uh, on both sides of the border from war-torn areas, Afghanistan, Syria, etc. And, and uh, I've written speeches for politicians who basically say, you're welcome to be here, but leave your problems at home. We're not interested, which is not a bad bit of tough love. So that's my long-winded way of saying, why keep the connection there? I know the Boston Irish like to be connected to Ireland, but why keep connected to that place that only people four generations ago knew much about? What was the purpose? Because that's who we are. And, you know, I never heard, you know, we Colville Confederated Tribes is the name of the reservation, our modern reservation form of reservation today. But I only heard my grandmother say, uh, some Ikes, that I'm some Ikes. She never said anything else. And, you know, she used to talk about and uh, the foods and the lands and, you know, the weaving and all the other things that they would do. And that's the life that she lived. And that's, she would always tell us about our culture and our stories and, you know, the culture attached to our stories. And, and even my aunts, you know, um, would say, this is who we are, you know, you know, you're not somebody else. And even a lot of our elders that I grew up around, you know, would say that, you know, you might, everybody may want you to be non-Indian, but when you walk down the street, they're not going to recognize you as being white. But, you know, if, and then in your heart too, you're going to, you know, we want you to feel and know who you are. And be and feel very proud of that, and that's what we want for our gener future generations as well. We want to keep that intact with them because we want them to have a strong sense of self and identity, you know, and to know the culture and the language. We want to know where um, you know their ancestors came from, so they can continue to protect those areas because those are really important areas to us. And at some point in time, we just have to do that. We can't. You know, there is so much else going on and, you know, tribes fight battles all the time. You know, even if we have to litigate those issues um, today, we don't like to litigate everything, but that's sometimes the last course of action that we have. And so, uh, uh, but so whatever we can do, just, you know, whether that's legally, politically, or just, you know, how our people um, handed down knowledge from one generation to the next, that's all very important to who we are. That's not going to change. I mean, of who we are, and we don't want that to change. Now, I don't want to make a, a, a bridge too far or too long a bridge or, or be silly, but I think that many of the things that you've said should resonate with people who have very fond memories of, you know, mom's turkey dinner at uh, Christmas or the uh, lake or the cottage or the family vacation. Uh, so, in other words, being connected to food and ceremonies and land is, um, is something we all have. And, and, and I guess that's how we should try to understand what you were trying to do, what your colleagues were trying to do. Right. <clears throat> you know, most, I think, the general public are really unaware that our people are still out there. We still gather our traditional foods. We still gather our traditional medicines. We still go and pray you know in all those areas of where our how our elders and our ancestors taught us to you know those are still ingrained into us you know it's a part of like i said our psyche of who we are and you know because we witnessed this from other elders from our own people and um you know i don't think of it i never used to think that ever that i'm extinct that i'm not an indian person or a native person or some ikes you know it just never entered my mind, but to everybody else saying you no longer exist, you know, I mean, if, if you were told that, if you're Irish in Ireland, you know, you know, Ireland don't, doesn't exist anymore, you're no longer Irish, I mean, how would you feel about that? Well, that, let, me, let me tell you how I feel about something. I, I, I have some uh, dear friends in, in what is now the United States who say, gee, you know, 
we, we think of you Canadians as just like us. And I have to politely say, I don't want to be thought of as just like you because we aren't just like you. We have a lot of different histories and traditions and governmental systems. And then I go to Europe and I, or Australia, and I've run into people who think that uh, uh, when I say I live in Vancouver or I live in Toronto, both of which I have, uh, they'll write down USA on the uh, hotel registry. And I have to really assert the fact that Canada is a separate country. And I can tell you that our, our foreign ministry uh, has as its goal to remind everybody around the world that we are not America. So I'm, I'm on your side on that uh, regard as well. Now you mentioned praying and let's get into that just for a second because I've heard someone uh, describe the return to your traditional land in British Columbia in a similar vein as a Jew going to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem or a Roman Catholic going to St. Peter's Basilica. Um, is that uh, too far or is, is that a similar kind of experience? <clears throat> I think it's a similar kind of experience. You know, when you go back and you see these areas and, you know, that your parents or your grandparents might have told you about and you're walking in that same country and you know that the language and the culture or how they respected those resources and how we would pray for those resources and for ourselves and each other and the way that we did, you know, it, it just seems like all of that comes pouring back over you. And uh, it's just almost an indescribable feeling um, to be able to experience that. And, you know, it's not right that we can't have access back into those areas. You know, that's where our people came from. That's where my people came from. And I want my children to be able to have and be able to experience that and to have that respect and recognition of who they are. And, you know, and their right to be able to pray in their own way. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I think, a very similar feeling and, uh, um, you know, especially since our people have, in, have been severed from some of those areas for so long, you know, um, the country there is so beautiful. And uh, I used to remember hearing, you know, my grandmother talk, tell stories to us about that. And we have a lot of uh, uh, legend stories and things that are, you know, um, it's more than just a story because it like might be about uh, the creation of the world or, you know, of the natural resources or how to respect and to, to pray for something in our way. You know, a lot of those things are handed down to us in that way. And so I, I looked at, you know, some of those mountains and hillsides and some of that just starts coming back. You know, she used to talk about how they would go there to pick berries or they would go up to the tall mountains and gather wool, you know, and make things out of it. And, um, you know, that they couldn't go up there anymore, you know, of not only, like you said, it was just a, a hand wave and cross the border at one time, but things became more and more restricted, even during her time. And, you know, economically and financially, they just didn't have the means all the time to travel back and forth, um, not as often as they'd have liked to. And we've covered history, culture, food, uh, <laughs> even religion, a bit of philosophy, um, and uh, let's, let's keep going because you have rights in Canada now, uh, according to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, you mentioned the word access. Now you can have rights without access. I have a right to free expression in my country. You have a right to uh, free speech in America, but that doesn't mean we can go knock on uh, the governor or the premier's door and say, excuse me, would you get out of here? I want to uh, exercise my right of free expression. Uh, there's a time and place uh, and rights conflict. So what do you make of access? Uh, what do you make of how you and your uh, fellow citizens get across that border in order to exercise the rights that are now constitutionally protected in Canada? There's going to be a lot of work to do ahead of us. And I know that not everything's going to happen overnight. But I think that we do have that recognition as a First Nation in Canada, I think puts us at a much, in a much better position 
to be able to work, you know, with the Canadian government and the ministries there, you know, to um, look at access and, you know, protection of those areas and those sites that are really important to us. And I think bringing a greater understanding of who we are and why that's important to us, and maybe even some of the things, the activities of what we need to do or would like to do back in those areas. Um, and, you know, it, it's not that it's going to be all so threatening to the communities or anything. I think there's going to be the vast majority of it, you know, is it going to be pretty harmless to most of the people up there? They, I don't know what, you know, their thoughts might be, but, uh, you know, because for one, you know, uh, there's about 3,000 of our members that are St. Ike's or have St. Ike's blood. And, uh, you know, so then developing those stronger relationships, um, as well as looking at the border crossing, you know, and the thought, I mean, could we achieve dual citizenship? I don't know. But, you know, those are some things that we're going to work on in the future to see, you know, how we can improve um, those government to government relationships. How about triple citizenship? Why not? <laughs> now, and by the way, uh, you know, you, you will, uh, when you're up here, you'll have uh, all the benefits of a governor general, um, and uh, you will have a, a head of government who answers questions from opposition politicians every single week, as opposed to the president of the United States, which, who does photo opportunities, but doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. answer questions from other politicians. So there, there's some interesting uh, side benefits. Now, let me get into the crass stuff. There was a, an ancient uh, Canadian broadcaster whom I knew, Gordon Sinclair, very controversial guy, but he said, news is always sex, death, money, love, and I forget what, there are five things. Let's get into the money. The area that you're talking about, where there were the two rivers, and I'm not sure where Site, site C is, but there's at least a, another proposal. That is what drove the British Columbia economy for the past 80 years, I think, since, since well before the mid 60s. And um, there is, are some mainstream uh, legal thoughts and philosophies that say the extraction of resources in North America is uh, uh, should be on uh, uh, on the financial statements of, of mining and other resource companies um, as you know unpaid debt. Uh, now that's getting pretty you know difficult, and that will also be a good uh, job security measure for lawyers. But do you have views, and do your your fellow citizens have views on any rights that you may have or backdated rights? To the riches in that area that used to be your land you know that's something that we have had to deal with you know throughout all of our history whether we're here in the united states or whether we're we were our people are, are in canada and you know we i think we have a pretty good understanding of each other's histories because you know like i said families were severed and we would talk and we know of different situations i think legal political you know positions that the united states or canada took with regard to native people or first nations and you know of course there's been many social injustices you know environmental injustices you know uh, for native people and you know it's we do have fought many um, cases here, even in the United States, and uh, but all with the idea that, you know, value is, you know, it's, I think I've talked to even some professors and said, you know, when you talk about value, you know, there's different concepts from a Native person to a non-Native person and what value means. Of course, you know, you know, financial resources is important to everybody, but, you know, in our terms, our wealth is not materialistic. It's the world around us. And so, you know, having a healthy world around us is that's what my elders used to tell us, you know, the health of the landscape and of our fish and wildlife and the air we breathe is more important to us than anything else. And so if there's anything that we can do to influence, you know, to improve or 
um, you know, the, the natural resources or any of those resources like that. And if, you know, there are things, areas where we feel that it, they need to be mitigated or litigated or whatever we need to do, you know, that, those are things that we'd have to deal with in the future. So it's not like that we're going to leave anything out at this point in time, you know, and I, I've always said, too, that, you know, we've always wanted to look at being a, a good neighbor or being helpful, you know, and that uh, so if there are ways that we can, because our tribe, we have some of the ministries came down and visited the Kabul tribe, and they were pretty surprised at the resources that we have here. They were saying our natural resources staff almost was equivalent to the province's in British Columbia. And, you know, so we have our own expertise, not only, you know, from a scientific perspective, but also from a cultural perspective. Our people know our areas, they know our lands, we know relationships between plants and water. I mean, that's all ingrained into our culture and a lot of the things that are taught to us, that's our wealth, you know? So financially, our tribe has spent millions on litigation. And, you know, I hope that that's not something that people are fearing or thinking. But, you know, again, that's always, like I said, uh, last recourse, if nothing else, is, um, you know, there's nothing else that we can do. I hope we don't have to do that. I hope that we can work together on some of these issues. And um, but mostly right now, we want to focus on reconnecting our people back together, both in Canada and the United States. And then looking at those areas that are important to us, um, you know, especially our, like I said, the, the, our, our ancestral um, grave sites, those traditional gathering areas, our traditional foods, you know, the, the water, the environment, if there's ways that we can help out, you know, in making some improvements, that's improving our wealth, so. Well, I don't doubt it. And uh, let me just uh, state the obvious cliche that for uh, hundreds of years, there have been uh, people who have either uh, not listened or silenced uh, your people and uh, uh, or, or, or simply not wanted to listen or there wasn't a forum to listen. So what I'd like to do in the remaining uh, time that you'd like to take is let you say any last words that you uh, uh, would like to say about this topic. <clears throat> Well, this has been, you know, a long journey to get us to this point. And it's something that, you know, many, I guess, uh, just people in general don't really understand everything that has happened to Native people, both in Canada and in the United States. You know, like, there have been many injustices to Native people and uh, that most people are just totally unaware of. Most people don't know that our families were broken apart and children were taken. Most people don't realize and know that uh, there were so many efforts to assimilate us and terminate us and you know say that we are extinct. The larger general public, they're unaware of that. There is even people who don't even know that tribes still exist today. You know, I mean, I've you know worked in federal and state government here in the United States. You know, I'm actually uh, um, all but dissert dissertation for my PhD. And so I've worked in, you know, the educational systems. And I meet people all over who said, well, tribes, we didn't even know there were tribes still in the United States. Well, we're still here and we still exist. And we're fighting for our people and for our future generations. And we're also, you know, really wanting to, to maintain that uh, connection we have with our world around us because there's so many things that are there you know the the stories of how those areas were created you know we have legend stories and coyote stories that tell us about those things and uh, you know then the handed down knowledge of our people we're trying to preserve that for our future future generations like I said, just as anybody else would, you want your people to survive and, you know, you want them to survive merely just being alive every day. We want them to be intact with their language, with their culture, with their knowledge of their ancestors, you know, with uh, looking at education, look, maintaining those values. Like I said, our, our, I think about a lot of the elders I've spoke with here and, I, you know, they, they were afraid 
we had this group of children with these elders working together and to pass down knowledge. And the children, we asked them, what does wealth mean to you? First thing they thought of was cars, houses, games, you know, and, and then the elders, they were really surprised by that. They said, how did this happen in just one generation down, you know? And they were saying, no, in our ways, you know, in our language, the wealth is the wealth of our environment. And they were explaining everything to them. So that's a big fear, you know, is that we do not want that assimilation and acculturation to occur. I think there is a value and a wealth in diversity, you know, of who we are as a people all together, even though we're here together on this same place, you know, that that it's the diversity is a strength. It's not a weakness. So, well. Chair Costin, you have put a little dent in the um, lack of information that you have cited, and you have made a connection with some people who are closer to their border, the uh, Vescatomacati who um, straddle the uh, St. Croix River. You can throw a stone across it when the tide is out. Uh, so you have done your bit today, and I'm sure that uh, you have a lot of work ahead of you, and I hope that we can keep in touch. Yes, this, is, this decision was huge for us. But it was, I think, in a much larger scale for all of those tribes across the U.S. and Canadian border with all these transboundary issues, you know, it really does hopefully provide and create an opportunity for them as well. And hopefully that both the United States and the Canadian government will um, provide all of us, uh, those along the border, with that respect of our history and who we are. Good luck. All right. Thank you.